you're talking about things that have high uh, nutrients but low calories, right? Correct. I mean, you're getting a lot of for- bad information that's killing people, and those people should be put in jail that you're having on your show. Uh-oh. Okay. Sean Baker, you need to be put in jail. Should carnivore diet pushers be put in jail? That's what this doctor says. Let's find out. I'm Dr. Eric Westman, and I am sent this video, Carnivore Diet Pushers Should Be Thrown in Jail, <laughs> from Mark Bell at Super Training Gym. Uh, so, of course, you always want to look at where the video is coming from. Consider the source. And Mark Bell asked Joel Furman, an MD, so Mark's not an MD, but he's asking, he's interviewing a doctor, and I, I know who Dr. Furman is. I'll tell that story in just a minute. Uh, he's a board-certified family physician, Dr. Furman, and best-selling author, recognized expert on nutrition, natural healing, specializes in preventing and reversing disease through nutritional methods. Yeah, you'll find out though that our our tactic, our what we use, is different. Now we both are on the same mission to help our patients, um, and so let's see what Dr. Furman says. Like some of the people we've had on this podcast. Uh, like Dr. Sean Baker and a few others, uh, they're primarily guys that like to eat meat. Right. And so they're talking about, they are talking about nutrient dense foods, uh, but those have more calories. And you're talking yeah. about things that have high uh, nutrients, but low calories, right? Correct. I mean, you're getting a lot of for- bad information that's killing people. And those people should be put in jail that you're having on your show. Uh oh. Okay. Sean Baker, you need to be put in jail. That's right. <laughs> what are you saying? Hang on. So Dr. Furman. <laughs> There's no law against promoting a carnivore diet. It's not illegal, to my knowledge, unless you've written one. So this is where I I, I try to be precise with my language. You know, I try not to persuade or fear monger. And and actually, it's not illegal to (laughs) promote. So I mean, now, oh, wait, you're, you're using colorful language to make people think that you, they should go along with your position, right? So I've also heard this said that it's medical malpractice to use a low carb keto diet. No, no, it's not. It might be in your opinion, but there are organizations that recommend low carb keto diets. So if you have organizations that recommend it, you have a, a practice and, and uh, organizational based kind of practice. It's not malpractice. It's actually doctors work in different ways. And, you know, uh, a doctor that doesn't use my approach, might not know about it, might only know uh, pharmacy or or drugs and might think what I do is outside what they know or what they do, but that doesn't mean what we do is malpractice. Our group of doctors practice the way we do. And and, um, so uh, it's not, uh, 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 okay, he really wasn't saying he should be put in jail. He was just colorful language. Baker, you need to be put in jail. That's right. They should be stopped. We should like silence them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let me, let me just answer that. Okay. Two, th- two things. One, the most proven methodology to slow aging. The, I should say the only proven methodology to slow aging and live longer is moderate caloric restriction in an environment of micronutrient excellence. And let me say that one more time because people should write this down. Moderate caloric restriction in an environment or context of micronutrient excellence. And by micro... I agree. I, I, Dr. Furman, that's... Yeah, so there are studies that show that if you restrict the calories, you know, until you eat less, so you're not typical American diet. And, uh, you know, the type of food, I think it's arguable, you can eat lots of different ways. But it seems like the less you eat, the longer you live. Um, and uh, I remember seeing a researcher who had a primate colony uh, get up and talk about his research and the the primates lived longer if they were calorie restricted they had fewer chronic diseases they didn't have cancer and um, so yeah I I think uh, the idea is we don't want to eat so much and and uh, you know if you're eating things that you can't stop eating uh, you get into that sugar and ultra processed food addiction, actually, you don't want to eat that way. And I think Dr. Furman and I are on the same sheet uh, here, um, singing from the same sheet of music about wanting to reverse and, or eliminate disease. Micronutrients, I mean, vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, and antioxidants, right? Meat has no micronutrient load. 
has no phytochemicals and, anti- and antioxidants. It doesn't diffuse free radicals. Processed foods has no, I'm saying a piece of chicken is like a bagel. They both are sources of calories with no significant load of micronutrients, especially the phytochemicals and antioxidants that diffuse free radicals and advanced location end products. <clears throat> the buildup, see, aging is all about the buildup of metabolic toxins and waste products that age us, like, like free radicals and advanced location end products. Eating more calories in general, just consuming calories produces more free radicals. The more calories you eat, the more free radicals you produce. The more calories you eat, the faster your metabolic rate gets, and the faster your metabolic rate means the faster you're aging. This is contrary to most anybody you have on this podcast because they're all giving you incorrect information. Do you think it's untrue that we can get everything that we need from animal product? We can get everything we need from animal products. That's the most ridiculous statement I've ever heard. Hang on. <laughs> you go, uh, Mark, Mark Bell. Uh, get back at Dr. Dr. Furman. Yeah, so actually, so carnivores, they don't eat plants. So what... Uh, the plant-based folks are going to tell you is that there's something special in that plant that, that helps you out. And, and uh, you know, uh, it, that's really not been proven. Uh, you, can get all, you can get all of the nutrients in terms of essential nutrients and feed your body what it needs. But the argument here is that you could add in uh, phytonutrients, it's, it's something from a plant. Or, or you might add in some wine where it has resveratrol or some other compound that might help you. Uh, that, so that's like adding different supplements to it. Um, but to say it's the most ridiculous statement I've ever heard, oh, oh wait, that's an exaggeration, like being put in jail. Uh, yeah, I, I got it. Everything. That's what we're hearing, that you can get everything that you need uh, in terms of uh, especially micronutrients um, from a liver, heart uh, and uh, the, the, just the uh, the amount of ignorance is just incredible and the amount of false information giving out to people is really um, quite disturbing you know it's what so what why I'm saying, do you think that's false information you're saying that meat doesn't have micronutrients in it well we know right now that this the, the um, type of nutrients that elevate cert one and AMP kinase the longevity proteins that stabilize the DNA are mostly phytochemicals found in plants and that the ARE, the ARE, or the antioxidant response element that's activated on our genes, on our, on our genes that protect the cell from free radical damage and aging, is fueled by the phytochemicals found in plant, plant foods, mostly green vegetables, like the isothionic science found in green vegetables. So we know that each broccoli has a thousand different nutrients in it. Each piece of strawberry has There's some people that will say that the antioxidants are uh, mainly for the vegetable itself and that they don't uh, do much in the human body. Well, they could have a theory. You could have all kinds of nonsensical theories, and you could make claims on the make on the on a podcast. Yeah, so uh, you go, Mark. Mark Mark's well coached, um, and uh, there's something that that I, I've seen. I've been in this research space now for 25 years, and it turns out when we started our first research on low carb, high fat diets, that's kind of the opposite of what Dr. Furman pushes, uh, and uh, there were, really wasn't any research out there. There was no research to say high-fat diets were bad, no clinical trials. So that was curious to me. I, I, I thought Everyone says it's bad. There must be some research to say it. No, it, there was a taboo on studying high-fat, low-carb diets, the Atkins diet, for example. So nobody studied it. So I visited doctors who were using the diet. Went to do, did my due diligence before studying, do, do, before doing research, went to travel and, and meet these folks. Um, you know, it turns out that uh, some programs use some broccoli and, or some vegetables, some don't. And we're talking here about a carnivore diet, which is one without any vegetable matter. It's just, a, it, I see a carnivore diet as sort of a subset under a low carb keto diet. Um, the more you study something, the more you're going to find things that, that are, are mechanisms and all this. And, and, you know, the plants have been studied for so long and there are people who are pushing it for their, their kind of anti, um, anti-food ethical treatment of animals agenda that you might get very small studies to, and they get overblown. And, and yet, you know, it sounds so reassuring. But then, you know, have you noticed I, I'm not 
too pleased with how Dr. Furman is using his language. The persuasion is a little out there, putting someone in jail. It's the most ridiculous statement ever. Um, this gets to my anecdote with Dr. Furman. So years ago, I'm in a medical, uh, medical clinical organization. I'm the vice president of this organization. And there were three people giving a talk. It was Dr. Volek, it was Lauren Cordain, a PhD, it was Dr. Furman. Uh, so there was a, Dr. Volek is a low carb scientist. Dr. Uh, uh, Cordain is not an MD, but he talks about the hunter gatherer paleo diet. And then there was Dr. Furman talking about the plant based diet. So I, I got up to the microphone back in the days when you could do that. Now I'm afraid people like me made it so there are no microphones at meetings. You have to type it in and then the, the, the questions get screened. But so I, I had carefully thought through a criticism of every talk. It was in a panel discussion of three different diets, which one's the best. It was, it was a good presentation. Everyone put their, their research out. And I had a criticism about, you know, Dr. Cordain, um, you know, we really don't have any randomized trials on what you're talking about. That's hunter gatherer, Dr. Volek, uh, you know, this is gosh, 15 years ago, I think Dr. Volek, you have some research among healthy people. We need more studies on low carb diets and Dr. Furman. I mean, you really didn't present any randomized trials and you're just, you're just talking about a book. Well, so I tried to criticize all three people in a, a diplomatic way before, you know, a, mi a millisecond past Dr. Furman was down my throat was like, this is a you know, medical organization. Uh, it was, you know, how can you say this? There's no evidence about low carb diets. Although Jeff Volek just presented the research. And, and so actually the whole time the, for that Q and a, uh, was monopolized by Dr. Furman telling me what an idiot that, oh, he's still talking about idiots out there. Um, and, and then, you know, I tried to say, well, I've done research. Oh, wow. That didn't count. And, and that's so my, my, uh, uh, friend at the time, he was the research organizer of the meeting. Hal is, comes down toward me and says, you know, Eric, sit down. So it turns out there were a couple people in the audience who complained to the organization that the vice president of the organization would come up and criticize. I criticize everybody, but would criticize someone we invited to the conference. And I wrote Dr. Furman a letter of apology because the the board asked me, you know, you're the vice president, you know, it kind of ticked off some people. We got some, some com complaints. So I did, I have a communication with Dr. Furman because I, I apologized that, uh, he came to our meeting and, um, uh, and gave him some feedback. So that's my, <laughs> it sounds like he hasn't changed much in terms of causing pe calling people ignorant. And I, I get to say, I'm, I was one of those people some years ago and I don't know, our, our science has progressed and we just in the last month, there's a, now a book called ketogenic. It's a textbook of cardio, uh, excuse me, textbook of carbohydrate reduction or carbohydrate restriction and health. And it, uh, it's a medical text designed for teaching doctors and nutritionists, dietitians. So, um, anyway, our, our science has progressed. And, um, when, when, um, he says the science doesn't support that. I have to caution that with the science that I know doesn't support it. And, and that's kind of true with any, with everyone, isn't it? I mean, the, the science that I know says a certain thing, the science that someone else says might be true. I mean, it, we don't have the ability to read everybody's research, right? Actually, the science doesn't support that. The science is um, overwhelmingly and irrefutably um, secure and, irre you know, and comprehensive that phytochemicals extend human lifespan. So with your style of diet though, you're not saying that meat is bad because meat is part of- No, uh, I'm saying meat is bad. I'm saying the evidence is, um, is irrefutable. That as people eat more meat in their diet, their increased risk of cardiovascular death and cancer deaths increase, and that meat raises IGF-1 to, to um, cancer promoting levels, and you can't have prostate cancer. You can't, in other words, let me make a few things clear. We give studies more credence if they go on for decades mm -hmm. with many hundreds of thousands of people, or many thousands of people. We look at hard endpoints like death. Um, every study that looked at animal product, in, increasing animal product consumption, so it's increased risk of death and when we're looking at hard endpoints, the studies we have more credence. 
For example, not only does, so example, a recent study on 44,000 women followed for 25 years, they, ra- they rank, ranked their amount of animal products they ate versus plant foods they ate in their diet and gave them a score of 0 20. 0 would be like a vegan diet, 20 would be a, an Atkins diet or a keto diet. And they found that for every point where they increased animal products, cardio, <clears throat> every point cardiovascular deaths went up by 2.5%. So that those, the Adventist Health Study was published in 2001 showed that, um, well, it showed that people with more animal products had shorter lifespans and, and people were eating a little bit of animal products. But in the 2018 Adventist Health Study 2, they, they, um, they showed um, five quintiles of nut and seed intake and those with the highest quintile of nut and seed intake compared to the lowest quintile had a 40% lower cardio death rate with higher intake of nut and seed. When they divided the animal product intake into five quintiles, they found those with the highest amount of animal product compared to the lowest amount had a 60% increase in cardiovascular death rate. So if, you, if that's compelling, it, it, it turns out that I've reviewed these kinds of studies before. These nutritional epidemiology studies are what we call hypothesis generating, not hypothesis testing, meaning it's not an experiment where you can ter- determine causality. And the odds ratios or hazard ratios or relative risks for meat eating or any really any of the things that these people talk about is so small. The current evidence-based medicine world and even going back to theories about causality would dismiss them as not being um, not being large enough to be clinically relevant. So you're going to hear well, there's 48,000 people follow well. If it's really that strong in a relationship, you don't need that many people to see that sort of relationship. If you needed 40,000 people in a drug study, that means you're looking for very small changes. And I bet he's using the relative risk instead of the absolute risk as a method of persuasion. The drug companies have done that for a long time. So not to worry, these, these are not experimental studies he's talking about. And again, the, the language being irrefutable, I... I, I um, uh, a, a scientist would think that, you know, we don't know everything and we're going to learn more things and maybe that there are a lot of ways to do it. So uh, uh, Dr. Furman is not a clinical researcher uh, and and uh, can apparently use this kind of language that uh, is something I'm not comfortable with. And right now we know that all the studies in human longevity show that as people eat more high-protein plant foods as a means of reducing high-protein animal products, lifespan increases, which we see in all the blue zones. More beans and more greens means longer life. No, no, not the blue zones. <laughs> Again, um, in, the, in the blue zones, you can see what you want to see. It's kind of like an ink blot test. You, you can actually pull out what you want to pull out. And uh, one theme is you want to live somewhere where it doesn't get cold, and, and that, that's good for longer life. Um, so uh, let's keep going. More high-protein animal products, shorter lifespan. More high-protein plant foods like hemp seeds, green vegetables, beans, broccoli, and you know, and soybeans. Longer lifespan. So they were trying to get professional athletes to get more of their protein from high-protein plant foods and less of their protein from high-protein animal products. When you take your protein from high-protein animal products, because the, the protein is all biologically complete and people are trying to maximize growth, you overshoot the amount of production of growth hormone and IGF-1. And overshooting IGF-1 allows angiogenesis and promotes cellular replication. When you're, promoting, when you're promoting excessive cell growth, you're promoting excessive growth of cancer. When you're taking a your protein from plant proteins, because they're not biologically complete, your body completes them as, the, as it, what it needs and the amount it needs. It's not going to overcomplete them. It can take stored amino acids in the interstitial lining or it can take back, absorb bacteria in the digestive tract to complete amino acids. But it's not going to overshoot the amount of proteins being ge- generated into growth hormone and IGF-1 into, into cancer-promoting levels. So what I'm saying now is that we can modulate cancer and heart disease with nutritional excellence. We can get you to a point with a favorable IGF-1, not too high and not too low, with a high intake of phytochemicals from plants. You know, there's no such thing that you can't get protection from heart, from heart disease and dementia and cancer without a high level of phytochemicals in your tissues. There's no way they're not present in animal products. What I'm saying, a piece of chicken is like a bagel because they're both the source of macronutrients, calories, but neither one has a significant phytonutrient load. Uh, This is uh, no experiments that I'm aware of to draw those conclusions. And a chicken is not a bagel. 
Uh, again, I'm not <laughs> so loose with my language. Without these phytonutrients that, that make... But aren't, aren't you kind of waiting? I want Mark. Mark, come on. Give, give some feedback. Colorful. colorful. They don't perfuse the body. They don't diffuse the production of free radicals in the brain. This bag of fat you have in your brain ages you and produces free radicals. These, these meat-based diets promoted by the paleo communities is scamming people based on what their if, ignorance. What if know? we're not, you know, what if we don't have an excess amount of calories? Mm -hmm. And what if we're not, um, you know, eating other things that are going to cause uh, harm to our body? So like, you know, primarily eating meat and you're not, uh, you know, causing an influx of uh, insulin and glucose and all these different things. Uh, do the rules change a little bit? Because a lot of the research uh, with, with some of the stuff that you have cited is uh, a lot of people that are on a standard American diet. Um, no, it's not and true. Eating red meat. No, it's not true. That's more nonsense. And well, well, wait a second. <laughs> Way to go, Mark. <laughs> Again, it's apples and oranges, uh, but I guess it's nonsense. That's a more, how should you say, um, um, just a more, an argument that these people make to try to promote a meat based diet based on a hypothesis. Well, now that is the pot calling the kettle black. What we've heard is basically hypotheses to promote. A plant-based diet and you know the more the more I go the, the people uh, just say it right at you they they tell you what they're doing and just switch the word so they're promoting a plant-based diet based on hypotheses not experimental evidence but that hypothesis has been looked at over and over again in the medical literature and shown to be wrong number one the shortest lived occupation in North America is linebackers on football teams. The amount of meat they had to eat to get that big mm. shortens the lifespan, number one. Uh, well, hold on. <laughs> there are probably a lot of other things that happen to linebackers. And did you hear earlier they were trying to get professional athletes to eat this way? Well, I, if, if professional athletes had already figured out that eating plant-based nutrition helped them, they would have. There are interesting documentary films, one called Serial Killers, C-E-R-E-A-L, not S-E-R-I-L, Serial Killers and Serial Killers 2, where actually elite athletes are eating low-carb diets. They're running on fat for fuel. That's the name of the second one. And they're actually breaking records, and making records in record time by not eating plants and not eating many carbs. So, you know, if these athletes we're going to figure it out on their own, they would have found this out. I don't know why they're trying to push it. Number two, when we look at people on those so-called keto diets, we see as plant carbohydrates go down in the diet, so does increased risk of death from both all-cause mortality, both cardiovascular mortality and cancer mortality. So not saying that sugar and honey and maple syrup and white rice and white potato are good foods. I agree that high glycemic carbohydrates shorten lifespan. But we don't buy a car by comparing it to a junkyard wreck. Just because glycemic carbohydrates are lifespan shortening, or maybe even worse than, than meat, doesn't exonerate meat or butter in the process. Oh, uh, well, there was a little relaxation of maybe they're good carbs, bad carbs. That's interesting. And I, I agree. Uh, and I think if you choose lower glycemic carbs, even within a vegetarian plant-based type diet, you can be healthy but it's not the only way to do it. You still, if you, if you, if you still studies based on replacement calories, take the sugar out and put in meat or take the sugar out and put in eggs or something. It might look not as bad as eating sugar, but take the sugar out and put in beans or greens and you get much more lifespan than taking the sugar out and putting meat. So the, these substitution studies he's talking about, this is not prospective research or experimental studies. And, and I have to just kind of comment that a lot of the studies that are being cited are, are again kind of cherry picked to to uh, show uh, a certain approach that rats have actually been put on low carb keto diets and in one study at least the rats live ten percent longer so it could be the sum total of all metabolic change is what does it not an individual nutrient actually and that so fat burning or being on a keto diet has so many other things and remember it hasn't been studied much it's only till recently you know, speaking in the last five years or so. And uh, because it's different, I'm sure you're afraid of it or, or you, uh, your doctor might tell you not to do it because if they don't know about it, it can't be good. 
Do you have some so, theories as to why? I just want to say this, that um, <clears throat> it's okay to have a theory, but then you have to say, if you, ha if you want to know what's reality, and people get all these hypotheses, we have to have a comprehensive look at the medical literature, the scientific literature, and see what the long-term data shows. And the long-term data disproves, disproves all those theories that people have trying to promote what people want to eat, especially in the bodybuilding community and among trainers and things. And people are overly consumed with size and they don't recognize that when you're going to overly consume with size and you're trying to maximize growth, you're going to max, you're going to also be permitting, shortening your lifespan of the process. We want to maximize fitness and strength and not be the biggest human being you could possibly be. Isn't using you know? like the linebacker of a football field. I mean, Linebackers are massive as it is. Yeah. Saying that meat causes a linebacker's death, isn't that kind of too strong of a, like, it, it's not the meat that killed the linebacker. There's many other things I can go in, especially with like the dangers of that sport in general, right? Yeah, we don't know exactly what killed the linebacker. Maybe they took steroids. Maybe they had a stressful, I don't know what, all the factors that could have killed them, but we yeah. know that striving to be big and the diet you have to eat to get that big shortens lifespan. So what I'm saying right now is like, like, look at me. I'm a small guy. I'm five foot nine. I weigh 150 pounds, but at 65, I can do 70 push-ups and 20 chins. And I'm still very fit at my age. And I have a, and I have a six pack, you know, and I'm, and I'm solid, you know, um, I want to keep this way. Yeah. Now I, I can't, I could get to be 165 or 70 pounds by changing my diet and eat more meat, but that wouldn't be favorable for my lifespan. The goal isn't being to get bigger and unnaturally big. I want to be fit and strong for my size, but not as big as I possibly can be. I would need to change my diet to make it accelerate aging more to get bigger. I don't want to lift an, I don't want to be able to bench press an extra 50 pounds. I want to be able to be fit with my own body weight. So to get big enough to be a professional athlete. Now you can be a, the professional basketball players, tennis players, skiers, and you know, and, and, and martial artists and boxers love this type of diet because they're strong for their body weight and they can keep themselves light and they're really fit and more, you know, they're great. But if you but, you, but to be a linebacker, as you agree, you have to be extra sized, really big. I do. I and do. What I'm saying is that, a, that bigger athlete. Well, let's just think about that for a minute. That okay, Dr. Furman has figured out a way to eat for himself and it's working for him. Um, there are actually a lot of theories and hypotheses because there are no randomized trials. There's no experimental evidence about just about everything he says. So he's come up with ways, well, these things are called rationalizations in, in other language to rationalize why he's eating a certain way. He's thinking, well, I'll live longer. Well, you know, we don't know that for sure. Fleets, um, we know right now that eating to get that big is not lifespan promoting. I don't know. <laughs> nice to see Dr. Furman uh, on a video, not in person again. Uh, and if this is interesting, if you like it, be sure to like uh, and subscribe so you don't miss out on further videos. If you don't have my top 10 tips on starting keto the right way, check in the uh, description below. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell, and check out AdapterLifeAcademy.com.